Do you see my array of snacks? This is because I'm 11 weeks pregnant tomorrow. Yay! And I'm really sick. <laughs> so but they, they put me on meds. I, I'll, I won't refer to the Frau Rowe as the splash zone, so don't worry. Um, I should be fine. We've been fine so far. But if you see me like grimace, or I do like one of these for a second, just say a quick prayer for me, because it's not about you at all. It's just that the baby's moving around or like needs a snack or squirt because did you know they have this at Kroger? It's amazing. Um, so yeah, and we're all a family anyway. You guys know me, so it's, it's okay, right? Yeah. It's fine, totally fine. Thank you, thank you. Well, welcome back. Congratulations. Thanks. <laughs> so another baby's coming. Um, it's Rational Christie Community Night once again where we provide a space to stretch our intellects to work through difficult theological concepts and to feast on the centuries of wisdom, care, and concerns that our brothers and sisters in Christ work tirelessly to make available to us to continue to advance the kingdom of God. This is a place where you are being invited to be critical, ask questions, share doubts, and finally take a Christian apologist up on her invitation to an alternative belief system and alternative belief systems in general, not just Christian and other worldviews to join us in considering the claims of a, a peculiar carpenter from Nazareth. That's why we're here. I can't promise you that I know the answers to your questions, but I can promise that I will alleviate whatever tension you have to the best of my ability. And that's part of why these nights, that's part of why we gather together to do that. And worst case scenario, I have access to my hundreds of colleagues out there that specialize in things that some of us have never heard of, that I've never even seen. And these are experts in their fields, which means if I don't know the answer to the question, chances are I know somebody who will. And I'll get you guys connected. Um, first things first, I need to make a correction on a statement I made at the last Russia Christie Community Night during Q&A regarding the book Jesus Calling. I said Jesus Calling twice, and we're going to fix it on the, on the video, but I want to make sure if you were here and, and a little bit confused, what I meant to say was God Calling, because Jesus Calling is the sequel so God Calling is the one that was written in the 1920s. And if you were like, what? That's a brand new book. How, did, how was it written in the 1920s? It's because I said Jesus Calling twice. Sorry. It, it happens. It's God Calling is what I was referencing, the 1920s. It's Jesus Calling that's the sequel. And my criticism is still accurate when it comes to that. But if you were confused by that, it's because I said Jesus Calling twice. My bad. Um, tonight, our topic is the UN Gelion, or the good news and if you've been tracking with us, you'll notice that these past couple months have been a systematic movement from one topic to the next, all building off of one another, right? Last year, we established that truth exists outside of ourselves and that we can accurately assess our experiences based upon logical principles and assessing the accuracy of our worldviews. Then we spent a massive amount of time establishing that the Bible is trustworthy and complete in the form that you have it either on your phone or at home. It's free from contradiction and is most, it's the most internally pure piece of literature that the world has ever known. And that there are not any missing bits to it at all, right? No missing books, no lost gospels, no missing revelations. You don't need anything extra. And we tackle the number one objection to God's existence, right? That he, if he's all powerful and he's loving, then why do we still experience pain and suffering in the world? This year, we've been covering Christianity formal, the things that all Protestant denominations agree to, whether you come from a Baptist or a Pentecostal background, all the way to a Lutheran, an Anglican background, and everywhere in between. One of the questions that's often raised is why there are so many different kinds of Christians. If we can't even make up our own minds about what the Bible says, then how can we expect folks outside of Christianity to make sense of it, right? Don't all the different denominations demonstrate that there's a lack of clarity within the Bible itself on how we should believe? And doesn't that mean that we can pick whatever we want out of the Bible and leave the rest that we don't care for and call our own personal version of Jesus Christian? The answer is no. Um, and if you've been paying attention, you know that that's always my setup. There are parameters that define Christianity. There are boundaries concepts surrounding who Christ is, what the nature of God is, and what the message of the Bible is that remain untouched throughout every single denomination of Christianity. 
the reason that each denomination is called a denomination as opposed to a religion is because of these shared core beliefs. In theology, we call them primary beliefs or orthodoxy. And it's these primary beliefs that we have begun covering this year, beginning with who Jesus is, compared with the most common false Christs, and then stepping back to take a look at the nature of the Trinity and what it is, and now tonight, focusing on the message of the gospel. No matter where you fall, theologically, on secondary and tertiary issues, no matter what your upbringing, no matter how confusing different churches can get, the point is, loved ones, that so long as you are in the presence of Christians who hold to the tenets that we've been discussing so far, um, and that we'll be discussing, really, for the rest of the semester, you're in the presence of the family of God. That's what orthodoxy means. We're allowed to worship differently from one another, you see. We're allowed to have differences of opinions on how each of us individually follows God. Our freedom is limited by the parameters and the boundaries set up in this text, but it's freedom nonetheless. And so long as we do not teach or behave in a way that contradicts the words of this text, taken as a whole and in context, then we're permitted to demonstrate to the world that God has allowed for a significant variety and that it is a glorious and beautiful design. So we agree on the fundamentals, things like what constitutes the gospel, but we disagree on issues that do not directly deal with the gospel. Let me show you. The Apostle Paul deals with this issue in his letter to the church in Rome. At that time, new Christians in Rome were comprised of individuals from either a Jewish heritage or a Greek one, and those heritages were far from similar. Everything from how you dressed to how you moved through your day was different, and in some cases ran contrary to the preferences of the other culture. Case in point, diet. The Jews had lived for centuries with certain dietary restrictions. The Greeks, not so much. You see the first century Greek, um, you see in first century Greek and then consequently Roman culture, your world was one of despair. The world was all there was. When you died in their conception, at the moment of your death, there was zero hope for you not for your body or your soul, you entered the realm of the shades, a dark and dismal place, or you cease to exist entirely. The reason why Homer's Iliad, for example, ends with funerary rites is because for Homer, that is the end of the story. There's nothing else to write about because there is nothing else to write about, literally. And so you lived if you were part of the Greek and Roman culture, a hashtag YOLO lifestyle. Enjoy what you can now because that's all you're going to get. And very often that meant an incredible diet free from any restrictions whatsoever, a diet containing an ancient dish called pitasso. An ancient dish you know quite well, I think at least, because they called it pitasso, but we call it bacon. <laughs> what the gospel gave the Roman church was hope there's more to the story than this world. And what you have to look forward to in Christ doesn't even begin until you die. Because when you die, you finally get to go home. You think bacon tastes delicious now. Just you wait until you've spent Sunday morning with the Apostle Paul, meditating on what being united with Christ once again in heaven is going to be like. Now how good does post-sermon brunch bacon taste? Like heaven like being home. But for the Jews in Rome, they had been moving through a culture that had been interacting with God's ceremonial laws for generations. And now that Christ had come and freed them from the yoke of those laws through fulfilling those restrictions himself, suddenly what to do with that reality was foreign. God's people have always been set apart, looking and behaving differently than the local culture. Surely that means that completed Judaism would look similar to incomplete Judaism, right? Different, sure, but how different exactly? Certainly not Greek and Roman different. And I want you to think about that for a minute. Think about how awkward those first church potlucks would have been. The Jews on one side trying to stick to Shabbos restrictions and the Greeks on the other completely confused how any sane individual would turn away free bacon. And so we had a church comprised of members who on the one hand would begin looking down their noses 
at the undisciplined savagery of bacon-wrapped abundance, and on the other hand, individuals looking down their nose at members who certainly did not understand that the gospel was a cause for immense celebration. Apologists moonlight as meme smiths. This is why Paul takes great care in focusing on these areas in his letter to the Roman church. And as you read through the New Testament, you'll notice that Paul's letters to the different churches that he has planted are all dealing with these different issues. And each letter has somewhat of a theme. For the Romans, the theme is twofold. To the Jews, it is a reminder that we're all equal in Christ. There are no more Jews nor Greek, slaves nor free. Instead, what you have is a new identity in Christ. And that identity no longer allows for a sense of hierarchy or disdain for other members of the body of Christ who have taken Christ up on his authentic gospel, but perhaps don't look the same as the Jews on secondary issues. And for the Greeks, the letter serves to clarify that the grace we've been given in our salvation is indeed a cause for immense celebration, but it's not an excuse to continue in the sinful lifestyle of your previous identity. There are boundaries to our celebrating, and what we once were, we are no longer, as our new identity in Christ is a call for holiness. This is why Romans chapter 14 is cited by people like me, other apologists, as the plumb line by which we measure secondary and tertiary disagreements within churches. Some churches want communion every Sunday. Some want it once a quarter. Other churches wear albs and vestments, while others wear flip-flops and jeans. Some sit aghast at the thought of infant baptisms, while others sit confused as to why, if Paul teaches in his letter to the Colossians, that baptism replaces circumcision and we circumcise infants, then how could we not baptize infants into the faith in which they will be raised just like we do with circumcision? Which is correct. Well, as it turns out, we're free to do either, so long as we're doing so genuinely in service to one another and out of faith in God's liberty, and to the end that it edifies the congregation and brings peace. But it isn't good enough to just listen to somebody with a microphone explaining these things, right? I need to be able to show you from the scriptures what I mean. So let's do that. We're going to go to Romans chapter 14, beginning at verse 5. One person judges one day to be more important than another day. Someone else judges every day to be the same. Let each one be fully convinced in his own mind. Whoever observes the day observes it to honor to the honor of the Lord. Whoever eats, eats for the Lord, since he gives thanks to God. And whoever does not eat, it is for the Lord that he does not eat, and he gives thanks to God. For none of us lives for himself, and no one dies for himself. If we live, we live for the Lord, and if we die, we die for the Lord. Therefore, whether we live or die, we belong to the Lord. Christ died and returned to life for this, that he might be Lord over both the dead and the living. But you, why do you judge your brother or sister? Or you, why do you despise your brother or sister? For we will all stand before the judgment seat of God. So then let us pursue what promotes peace and what builds up one another. Do not tear down God's work because of food. Whatever you believe about these things, keep between yourself and God. Now, I've skipped around in order to demonstrate my point in that chapter. It's a long chapter because we've limited time together tonight and this isn't our intended topic, remember that it is your responsibility to keep me accountable in whether I'm representing God's word accurately. I have no doubt that after these nights you're at home and open your Bibles to make certain that I'm not making this stuff up or being too loose with the context, right? Just making sure. Okay, so we have freedom and we have boundaries. Secondary disagreements between Christians are to be subject first to the word of God second to the test of edification of the church, and finally to the enjoyment and glory of God. Each of us will give an account, personally, in the end of ourselves before God. Got it? Good. Moving on. All right, Anna, you said those were secondary and tertiary issues. What about the primary issues or the boundaries that we have to uphold? What are those? Well, essentially, these are the boundaries we're going to talk about tonight. And these are where they lay, at least for tonight's focus, are, they're in reference to how we become saved. That's what we're talking about with the gospel. That process is a crucial thing to you and I, as it's the only way that the gap is bridged between ourselves and heaven. It's a specific process that scripture warns us over and over again that we are to stay precise about. We're not to alter the message. And even if we are someone claiming to be a prophet, or even an angel 
comes to us bringing a message that has altered the components of salvation, we are told to reject their version immediately. As such a message might sound persuasive, but will in the end have zero saving power whatsoever. That's the point. That's why we reject it. Meaning that it is indeed possible and we ought to be actively anticipating being exposed to alternative gospel messages that cannot save us. And even more importantly, we must be actively teaching others that it's possible to be self-deceived. It's possible to spend your entire life considering yourself a Christian only to find out when you meet Jesus that you and he never had a relationship to begin with at all. So what exactly is the correct gospel? Well, first, gospel means good news. But in order to have good news, you have to already be in a state that is in the need to hear good news. In effect, a bad state. If we're not already in a state, in that state, a bad state, then we wouldn't need to hear good news. It would just be news in general, right? A passing entertainment, maybe. But as it turns out, we're in a very bad predicament indeed. All of us together, both in generations past and generations future. When our ancestors chose to leave our father's house by disregarding his clear and protective command for them. They brought upon all of us this predicament. And that predicament is that we suffer from a congenital birth defect that permeates every aspect of our humanity. And this birth defect is fatal. Not only does this defect affect every aspect of our lives, but it also affects the entirety of the earth. This means that this birth defect is not only something that affects humans, it also affects creation. It's a blight. Then this blight we call sin. Sin is the turning away from God and how he is working to renew us and the rest of creation as well as leading us back home to him. The Greek word where gospel and consequently good news comes from is euangelion, which carries a much more emphatic meaning than just good news. Euangelion means victory in battle. The war is won. Gospel is not simply generic good news as though it's some casual, oh well, I suppose that's nice sort of thing. Euangelion is the relief that the agony of the battlefield may be cleared of smoke and ash, that our wearied bodies and minds might finally rest, and that we have been liberated from the advance of the enemy. But what enemy? What war? And what victor? Well, the enemy is the blight, sin. The war is against the result of our defect, death. And the victor is God in the person of Jesus Christ. This then is the good news, that we in a state of death and despair in our circumstances might be reborn anew without fear of death and free of the enemy of sin, and that we might choose to come back home. But Anna, how was this accomplished? I wasn't a part of any battle that I know of. And I've lived a life free from most sin. I mean, I'm a pretty good person. I get that that's really good news for some really bad people who've done maybe some really bad things, but I'm certainly not guilty of that myself. So why is this such great news to me? Well, because growing up here in America, you've been exposed to a lie. And it's a very widespread lie. And it's been around for just long enough for people to have gotten used to its presence and forgotten that it's there. And the reason is because we like the way the lie feels. So we allow it to continue. And this lie goes something like this. Christianity believes in a good God that rewards nice people for doing their best. And that the good news is that through Christ's suffering, you've been gifted with access to immense prosperity that is yours for the taking if only you will live by the moral treatises that are taught in the scriptures and that are often shared by alternative religions. Deep down, human beings are good. Sometimes they get sidetracked, but they don't mean to be bad people, really. And if you'll just live with a compassionate heart, and if you'll just have a controlled tongue, and if you'll just live a clean life, then on that basis you will be acceptable to God. All most of us need is a little makeover here and there and the power of positive thinking. And the result of these things will be happiness, healthiness, and if your faithful obedience is sound, you'll be blessed with wealth as well. But this, what I've just talked about, is a lie. 
And that's not even close to what Christianity teaches. Christianity stands in stark contrast to this. What we need is not a little tweaking and optimistic thinking here and there. The reality is, loved ones, that a makeover for us would be tantamount to putting foundation, contour, and lipstick on a corpse. What Christianity actually teaches is not that we need a makeover. It's that we need a resurrection. We are dead people walking. And until God comes to live inside of you, you will remain dead no matter how virtuous the world thinks you are, no matter how many Sundays you sit at church, and no matter how intellectually you acknowledge the uniqueness of Jesus. You see, the real problem that we're facing in our world right now is not open opposition to Christianity. Open opposition has never been easier to identify. Even non-Christians can identify flagrant opposition to Christian foundations. Everything from how our government operates all the way to how Christians are being persecuted by the thousands in places like China and Sub-Saharan Africa. That's the obvious stuff. I'm not talking about that stuff. I'm talking about the more frightening problem. It's not the problem of open opposition, it's the problem of false profession. The folks that spend their entire lives saying, oh yeah, church is for me, Jesus is great, purity rings, youth group, the whole nine yards, I've done it all. But when it comes down to the details of their lives, Christ isn't there. What myriads of our pulpits and television sets have been poisoned by is a false gospel. Something we apologists have been railing on for years. Something that we have named moralistic therapeutic deism. In order to try to differentiate it from Christianity for our listeners' sake. Don't get hung up on the vocabulary. The false gospel, this false gospel, teaches that Christianity is a set of rules that are suggestions to how you are to achieve your best life. Ignore them if you find them burdensome, but if you find these rules work for you and help you achieve your life goals, well, then more power to you. That's the moralism part. Work harder, be better, live cleaner. Whatever that means to you, so long as you realize that it's entirely up to you. Where the therapeutic part comes in is that it teaches that God is only interested in changing you if you are wanting to be changed meaning that God's only purpose in your life is to comfort you no matter how you're behaving. He has no interest in any objective truth, removal of sin, or making you aware of what things are getting wrong. The only thing that is wrong with you is if you're living a life that is inauthentic to your own self-image. God never wants you to experience guilt, remorse, or contrition over the state of your soul. You're mostly good after all, so why concern yourself elsewhere? And finally, the deistic aspect is that God is not personally invested in how you live and what concerns your thoughts. Pray to him if that helps you. Use him whenever you need something in your life. There he will sit unconcerned as we continue to treat him like an invisible sugar daddy in the sky. As reverently as the worship band will allow us to while continuing to repeat the chorus line of the benediction song. And it's under these parameters that a lot of our young ones and even some of us raise our hands or walk the aisle when the music crescendos at just the right time and the lights fall perfectly down at the front of the church. And we watch as they leave that service and continue to live in a way that is indiscriminately the same as their non-Christian neighbors. They've reacted to the desire for a better life, the temporary emotional relief of a spiritual moment, and they've missed Christ entirely because he was never present to begin with. His name is simply being leveraged and abused for the sake of a response. But what they ought to have heard was something along these lines. We've all turned our backs on our dad, and that's who God is. Every lie, every selfish act, every prideful thought demonstrates to us and to everyone around us that we don't want anything to do with him, and that we're completely disinterested in the holiness we were designed for. That unholiness, no matter how small, removes us from the presence of the perfect creator of the universe. The perfect God is perfect in his judgment as well. And since we have been measured by the standard of perfection and found wanting, when we die, we'll be judged rightly as the sinners we are, and our disinterest in reconciling with our dad will be honored permanently. He has no interest in forcing us to be with him against his will, or against our will. And this is a judgment that we are incapable of escaping ourselves because the truth is, we love our sin more than our dad. 
But since our dad, who has loved us with the greatest love there is since the beginning, and who has created us with the desire to know true love and joy in him in return, is a God who is merciful and good. He, in his infinite wisdom, has provided our redemption. He knows our sin addiction requires a hard intervention that only a loving dad can give. A redemption that has fulfilled the entire standard of holiness on our behalf, taking onto himself the penalty of our error. He has entered time, himself in the flesh, in the person of Jesus Christ to demonstrate what we are incapable of ourselves, holiness, no sin. And in his suffering and death on the cross, he voluntarily stepped in on our behalf, substituting himself and taking upon himself the penalty for our unholiness, a perfect fulfillment of righteousness, undeserving of death, and satisfying forever the perfect justice of God. It is this Christ alone and no other that God has accomplished this. And in order to demonstrate that God has been satisfied and that death no longer has any power, the battle is won. Christ was physically resurrected, proving to all and for all time that he actually accomplished our redemption. Our dad has provided the way out. He can come to get us in spite of our rejection, and he is offering to carry us home. Now that this has occurred, all that's left is to believe it, to place your life and all that you are in his hands and to take him up on his offer to declare you holy and carry you home. It's an offer that is entirely free and an offer that no other person may accept on your behalf. There's nothing you can do to deserve it, but before you say yes, make certain you count the cost, for in so doing, you take him up on his promise to change you and to move you into reflecting that holiness you regularly twist. You see, part of the reason we're in this predicament is because, remember, we love our sin, and the rest of the world loves it too. We desire to be selfish, to lie, to feel pride, to lust. We emotionally gravitate towards these things and we surround ourselves with people who agree with us and who feed and approve of our sinful behavior, which means that the natural result of your authentically taking Jesus up on his offer will be that the world hates you because so long as you're alive, you will be a constant reminder that the world is wrong. The result of which is that you must be prepared to have people despise your decision. Everyone from friends to strangers family members to coworkers. And if you're found in certain parts of the world, that hatred won't just be attempted embarrassment. In some places, it'll be that they behead you over it. You must be prepared to surrender even your life for Jesus' sake. No one but your Father in heaven knows how much longer you have left to decide. And the offer is there for you at any time and in any place. So which will it be? Are you ready to be remade and experience what you've been made for? Are you going to let him take you home or not? What do you think? Have you encountered that message before? Do you see what I mean when I say that American culture has been saturated by a gospel that is different from what you've just experienced? The true gospel is intense love, but it calls you out on the floor, and it leaves no room for you to think that you're okay without it. It exposes us in every way. As long as we're sinners, we need the gospel. Even if we've already taken Christ up on his offer, the gospel still serves as a reminder that what we're doing with our time here on earth is spreading it. Why sometimes we experience immense comfort and other times we encounter immense suffering. Jesus didn't die so that our personal power may be wielded to garner for ourselves whatever we want. Jesus didn't die so that you could be emotionally placated. Jesus died so that we might be saved from the penalty of sin. Jesus died that you might spend eternity with him. Jesus died so that you might know true joy and be liberated from despair. Jesus died to get us back home. We love our sin. And the power over that sin is a greater love, God's love for us, a love that is communicated to us through our Savior, a love that is only understood when our Savior transforms our hearts, a transformation that only occurs when we hear the gospel, which means that we must preach the gospel that transforms hearts. 
which means if you attend a church where the sermon message could easily be given in a synagogue or a temple or a mosque or a power of positive thinking convention and no one would bat an eyelash, it's not a Christian message. Jesus Christ is not a supporting actor in our biopics. He will not be your partial Messiah. You do not save yourself part of the way and he part of the way, cooperating as equals in your redemption. If he is something, he must be everything or he is nothing to you. And this reality will either be reflected in our lives as a natural consequence of our love for him and surrender of ourselves to him or its lack thereof will expose us as frauds. For those who wear the label Christian, the reality of true belief in Christ's offer will come out in how we live and how we respond to sin. In every case of every person claiming to be a Christian, your actions in light of your claim of belief determines to both you and those around you that you're either a disciple or an imposter. This is why so many people get confused by the relationship between works and faith and salvation. We become flummoxed when Jehovah's Witnesses and Mormons come to our door and say, oh, but you may think that you don't do anything but have faith in order to be saved. But scripture also says that faith without works is dead. Therefore, you must perform a life that is worthy of being picked up by the Savior in order for you to achieve salvation, in order for you to merit coming home. But it's at this point where they expose their lack of understanding of the scriptures the most because they've gotten the process the wrong way around. When we talk about how it is that we become saved, we're talking about the singular point in our lives when we take Christ up on his offer, the point when we jump into his arms. Everyone has differing testimony about how they arrived to saying yes to Jesus. That point in the believer's life is called justification. And it is our justification that is all that is required for us to be declared righteous even though we are yet sinners. And for Christ's work on the cross to apply to us, we add absolutely nothing to that process. Christ alone accomplishes everything that is needed to place you in heaven after you die. The only thing you bring, and don't miss this, the only thing you bring to your salvation is the sin that required the process in the first place. That's it. Christ's offer is entirely free and offered entirely by his grace and his grace alone, period, end of story. The evidence that we have actually taken Christ up on his offer and have true belief in the Messiah is that the natural consequence of being born again is that you desire to put away your old sins and begin doing good works. Works are a symptom of having already been saved. They are not the reason you become saved. You see the difference? It's essential that you understand that distinction because the verses that they're referring to when they say, but faith without works is dead, is from James chapter two, where James calls attention to the people who claim to be Christians, but who demonstrate through their lives that they did not surrender themselves at all. Their faith, he says, is dead. All they're doing is mentally acknowledging that Jesus is the best bet and calling that faith. But that isn't the kind of faith that Christianity teaches at all. And if you keep reading, he points this out, even the demons recognize the power that Christ holds, but they don't forfeit their lives over to him. The people who claim to have faith but also have zero evidence for their faith, or that their faith is true, are in the same category as the demons as far as salvation is concerned. They're not saved. If you know Latin, this helps a little bit because the words that are used to show the difference in the scriptures is essentia, or mental acknowledgement, versus fiducia, or belief that results in a changed life. But because we don't have two different words in English in order to express the differences between the types of faith, oftentimes folks get confused because they're equivocating when the scriptures are speaking about two very different things entirely. In fact, it's for this reason, among several others, that all of the Protestant denominations arrived on the four to begin with. Did you know that? So, somewhere along the line, um, Roman Catholicism began teaching contrary to the gospel that we received. The culmination of such teachings resulted in the Protestant Reformation. That's how we got here. That's how you're even sitting in a vineyard church. You may remember hearing something about that from history class. 
you see the Pope's prior and the magisterium in charge of things had become practiced at spending more time in secondary and tertiary issues of the church than in teaching this. And for many years, the Bible itself was for the most part ignored, really. Um, in fact, by the end of the 16th century, if you ended up becoming a monk, it was entirely possible that you would spend your entire life and career never once opening a Bible, let alone reading it for yourself. I'm gonna spare you the details because this is a discussion for another day. But in a nutshell, what happened was that the combination of very little and in most cases zero access to the scriptures by the laity, that's us, the lay people, in order to keep the people claiming authority and teaching apparently what God is supposed to say, accountable, holding those guys accountable, it was combined with years and years and years of peripheral beliefs. And those peripheral beliefs began usurping the space where the gospel is supposed to sit. And that resulted in gospel-believing Christians being forced to set themselves up against what was being claimed as the only true church. Roman Catholicism had tried to redraw the boundary lines. And those boundary lines ran contrary to scripture. This is why the distinction between Protestant and Roman Catholic is still made to this day. This is why Roman Catholicism is not another denomination within Christianity. It's its own separate religion. And if this is the first time you're hearing this phrased this way, you can see it most clearly demonstrated if you're a Protestant trying to get married to a Roman Catholic. You're required, if you'd like to get married, to convert. Whereas if you're marrying interdenominationally, you don't have to convert to anything if you go from, say, attending a Methodist church to a Presbyterian one. But you must convert if you're changing religions. Protestantism makes a claim for authentic Christianity. Roman Catholicism also makes a claim for authentic Christianity. It is our job to test who is accurate in their claim and who is not. Let me pause on this subject for just a minute to show you something and I'm going to illustrate here. For Protestants, that's us, our beliefs may be summarized in five solas, sola meaning alone in Latin. You may have seen this before, I don't know. We believe that Scripture alone is the basis upon which we base our primary beliefs, and it's the Old and New Testament alone that are the word of God. No other teaching should ever be placed alongside the scriptures as equally authoritative. The Bible alone is the final authority by which and through which we test truth claims. Protestants also affirm that we are saved by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ Jesus alone to the glory of God alone. Those are the five solas. Behind me is the Latin. Roman Catholicism, on the other hand, is called the plus religion. I don't know if you've heard this before, because it takes these five categories that are up there and it adds to them. Where Protestants say scripture alone carries authority, Catholicism teaches scripture plus tradition of the Roman Catholic Church carries equal authority. The Roman Catholic Church often has extra information outside of the plain reading of scripture that lay people will not necessarily be able to understand and so you need Roman Catholicism to explain the scriptures to you. You are unable to go it alone. Instead of grace alone, it teaches grace plus merit as you must go through the work of engaging in the sacraments in order for grace to be infused into you. Without going through those motions, you cannot receive enough grace to save you. Instead of faith alone, Roman Catholicism teaches faith plus works. There are different categories of sin. Things we, that we would consider small sins are called venial, and major sins are referred to as mortal sins. Venial sin is removed from you through acts of penance. That's where the rosary comes in. If you go through the work of saying so many Hail Marys or Our Fathers, those are two types of prayer, then only after those works are accomplished and you have first confessed your sins to a priest, may you be forgiven and your sin absolved. That means the penalty for your error removed. If you become guilty of a mortal sin, however, there is no amount of penance that you can perform in order to know for certain that you will not spend eternity in hell for what you've done. The only way to become saved after that point is to perform an act of perfect contrition. Whether the act was successful, you'll never know until you die. And you're gonna find out. But 
It's recommended by those in authoritative positions that your best bet at pulling this off is to make an obvious and overly generous act of charity. Where Protestantism teaches that it is through Christ alone that men and God are mediated, Roman Catholicism teaches that it is Christ plus alternative mediators. Mediators like his mother Mary, for example, and other saints. This is why you will see prayer directed to people other than God in Roman Catholicism. These mediators carry special power that is beyond what normal Christians possess. And so, if you can convince Mary, or perhaps your patron saint, to go to God on your behalf, or to convince Christ to take you seriously, Christ's desire to answer your prayer may be persuaded more effectively if you let his mom do the talking for you. Which brings us to the final sola, to the glory of God alone. Protestantism teaches that glory is only ever ascribed to God. But in Roman Catholicism, Mary and the other saints are also ascribed a measure of glory, which is why they are venerated. You will see this most markedly by the amount of statues of Mary that are in any given sanctuary. And in some Roman Catholic churches across the globe, she will be the only altar at which you will go to pray. And the problem is, of course, that Protestantism and Roman Catholicism cannot both be right. If these works are required for us to be saved, then they are not just suggestions. We must fulfill these things. And to teach that these works are not required for the message of the gospel is to say outright that the gospel message that is being taught by the Roman Catholic Church, both back in the 16th century as well as today, is a different gospel than the one we have received originally from the apostles. Which means that the gospel of Roman Catholicism is a gospel that does not have the power to save. Which is why you hear apologists like me evangelizing two folks who call themselves Christian but only ever attend mass. At first, it looks odd to see what looks like Christians trying to talk to other Christians about Christ. But the reality is we cannot read people's hearts. And if the only thing they've ever been exposed to is Roman Catholicism formal, then we have to assume that may, they may not have ever heard the gospel at all, especially given the fact that the Roman Catholic Church has determined outright that what I have been teaching you tonight regarding the gospel and your salvation is not only untrue, but to believe in such things as tantamount to damning yourself to hell. And for teachers like myself, I am to be denied, denounced, and excommunicated. So if you like Pope Francis, fair warning, you're not supposed to listen to me um, now that I've called this out. Take a look. That is, after all, what that fancy word anathema means. Remember that what we're talking about to, on nights like this are the formal teachings of different religions. What the doctrines are, what the leaders have written, those types of things. It isn't necessarily what every person who wears that particular label believes. Lots of folks wear labels that do not necessarily really apply to them or labels they really don't understand. I have some very, very dear friends and even family members who call themselves Catholic referring to Roman Catholicism, but could never articulate any of the things I've shown you tonight, and in some cases would deny them outright, and be shocked, because they've never been exposed to them before. Um, I have good friends who are much closer theologically to what you would call a Methodist than a Roman Catholic themselves, but they call themselves Roman Catholic, and it's just a mislabeling. So know that when you're encountering people. You never quite know what they actually believe and you can't assume that they're wearing the right label. Um, if we were to give them a theology exam, in fact, a lot of them, and this is my main experience, are much more closely related in their theology to moralistic therapeutic deism that we've already discussed tonight. Um, it's just maybe they're more comfortable with a lot more candles. The reason they call themselves Catholic is because that is what their grandparents were and those were the last family members who regularly attended any type of worship service. So remember that just because you know someone who is a Roman Catholic doesn't mean that they automatically know or can represent Roman Catholicism accurately. And in some cases, they may even flat out deny these things. Just like it's true of anybody wearing any label. In this day and age, we have to test what they believe 
and evangelize from there. Claiming a certain label is no longer evidence of actual personally held belief. And it's important that if we're studying apologetics together on nights like this, that we remember that. This is why it's so very crucial that we know what Christianity teaches, and it's so that we can identify when someone is teaching something contrary to it. And it's so that we can spread the good news of the gospel to those who are under the impression they already know it, but are mistaken and still operating under the slavery of trying to make themselves acceptable to God. You're not able to make yourself acceptable to God. And the scriptures work tirelessly to remind us to take our eyes off of ourselves and place them on a God who is able. Which brings us to our final point this evening. Anna, how do I know for certain that I'm saved? Thank you for making certain that I'm super unnerved now. You've made it clear that there are false gospels and there's a true gospel and that this gospel cannot be altered and still have the power to save. You've spent the last two sessions browbeating us to the point of number one, and you've spent tonight doing exactly the same thing with point number two, and I agree with everything up there and that those things are true, and yes, even though I still struggle with my personal sin, the choices in my life are made with Christ in mind, but how is it that I can really know like really have something firm to hang my hat on when I'm feeling insecure, I don't feel close to God. How can I know that I'm going to heaven and not to hell when I die and that I'm not somehow deceiving myself? Well, the first way you know you're saved is this. Dead people don't concern themselves with whether or not they're saved. Or to use my earlier illustration, people who have rejected Jesus' offer to carry them don't concern themselves with whether or not Jesus is going to put them down. You have to be alive spiritually in order to fret. And the only way that you're spiritually alive is if the Spirit has already made you that way. Your concern in and of itself is evidence of salvation. Your worry that Jesus is going to set you down is an evidence that you're already picked up and on your way. But let's keep going. Jesus promises eternal life. It's him being true to his word that we're relying on, remember, not ours. He doesn't fake us out when we ask for him to save us. And you've already admitted that you've identified the true Christ and asked him to save you. Christ says in Luke chapter 11, beginning at verse 19, So I say to you, ask, and it will be given to you. Seek, and you will find Knock, and the door will be opened to you. For everyone who asks receives, and the one who seeks finds. And to the one who knocks, the door will be opened. What father among you, if your son asks for a fish, will give him a snake instead of a fish? Or if he asks for an egg, will give him a scorpion? If you then, who are evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will the Heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to those who ask him? So have you asked? Then he's given, and given in abundance. The feeling you have is the leftover part of living a life where we are saved by Christ's work back then. We are experiencing the result of knowing our sin and being conformed to the image of Christ, which is a process right now. And we are looking forward to being complete in the character of Christ then, when we die, and we finally get to rest in the presence of our greatest love that has ever and will ever be. Rejoice in your feeling of insecurity. Say a prayer of thankfulness and ask the Spirit to move in you to affirm his work in remaking you. Then go and teach others to do likewise, teaching the true gospel to everyone you meet. But Anna, what about the third one up there? We touched on that for like half a second, but we really haven't covered the resurrection in any great detail. Yeah, I know, um, and we're going to need to because the scriptures say that if Christ wasn't resurrected, then our faith is completely worthless and we're not saved, so it's kind of a big deal, but that's the plan for next time because we've already run out of time and gone over more than enough already, so with that, we'll open it up to Q&A. No, 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 none of that. I don't like applause.
remember community night is for you. You do what you, what you need. We don't have to talk about what we've talked about tonight. We can talk about anything at all. This is, this is your chance. What? I'm thinking girl just because it's one of this, this is so, I had a boy the first time around and this one's so different. Like I was sick with him too, but this one is like a completely different kind of sick and I just feel completely different. So I'm going, well, maybe that means it's a girl. I, I don't know. Is there a lot of drama? Yeah. No, the, the thing that they were t teaching me was that, like, they're like, well, how did you feel with, with your son? I was like, man, I didn't have to worry. I didn't have to, I didn't feel like I needed to wear makeup. You know, I, was, I felt just beautiful and just glowing. And this time around, it's like none of those things. And they're like, oh, it's a girl. <laughs> I'm like, all right, you guys will know better than me. Get it started. Let's do it. Uh, two favorite quotes, my, a question from the second one. So I love what you said. Uh, my two favorite quotes from your talk. Oh. The, the first one was, uh, the only thing we bring to our salvation was our sin. I thought that was really good. But the other one, maybe my favorite was, um, and I might butcher the quote, but I think you said, we don't need a makeover, we need a resurrection. Right. And I love that. Awesome. But my question is, with the makeover part, what are common makeovers that um, that people run after? So I think we could probably all guess two or three, but what are like maybe two or three for you that are the most prevalent in our culture that you see people kind of fall in the trap of? For sure, the prosperity gospel is the one I deal with the most. So we're talking like the real, real big Joel Osteen fans and the guys that it, basically it's everything is the power of positive thinking and live your best life now and how do you achieve those things? Um, and you'll notice, I can't, I've got my Bible somewhere. My little Bible, Joel Osteen, when he does his opening, I always teach my, my students to, they're like little red flags, things that you look for that Paul just like, ooh, that might not be good. Um, Joel Osteen will pick up a Bible at the beginning of his, of his sermon, and he'll raise it up, and he'll say like something along the lines of, um, you are who God says you are, you can do what God says you can do, yes, more, I, I, and he uses the I am, and he says that you are the I am, which is like really bad. Um, but then you'll notice he's just holding the Bible up, and then he does this with it, and it never is touched again. It's not opened. It's not referenced. It's just used. <laughs> That's a real bad sign that you're being offered a makeover instead of the gospel. The gospel is uncomfortable. It is, and it's not. Nobody. You know, it's hard. Part of the part of being afraid to give the gospel is because it's scary to give the gospel. You're about to tell another human being that they're not as good as they think they are. Nobody wants to do that. We don't rejoice in doing that. And in fact, the people that do are kind of weird and you're like, I'm worried about you. Um, but that doesn't make the message any different. It's a message we have to hear. So always be, if you're, if you're sitting in the church service and you're never convicted and nothing ever touches you personally and you're constantly being told you're fine, you are not fine. It is time to find another church. There are so many churches out there. Go try a different one, please. Podcast, call me. I'll help you. Like, just don't. If the guys are usually, I can't talk about everybody, but usually if they're on TV, just kind of just. <laughs> I just, just don't. Like CBN, just don't, just. Prosperity gospel, that's what I deal with the most. <sighs> yes? Jumping off of that, mm -hmm. um, you know that I just obviously left a church where the gospel was pretty much never preached. Um, when, as evangelists, what we're, fi well, what I'm personally facing now is calling out the error of false preachers is uh, resulting in accusations of being divisive and hindering the kingdom. And so when we're trying to point out other people's flaws, I mean, what's the best way to do it in, you know, because they're saying just point out the good things, but by nature of sharing the gospel, I'm pointing out what they're failing to do. Mm -hmm. So what, how do we reach people from that congregation specifically? If they're presenting themselves as Christians in the first place, um, and you need, you have, a, you have a bone to pick. Protocol says you're supposed to go to the person first. Give them a chance to clarify. Give them a chance to talk about their theology. Um, you know, we're all, we're all human beings, including the preachers, and they need a chance to be able to do that. Um, but the other thing I would do, too, is make sure that you're, you, a lot of times in a lot of churches nowadays, you can review previous sermons. 
and just take a look and see if this is a theme, you know, or if this was a one-time thing. Um, because it's entirely possible that they're responding to something that happened to their congregation and you don't know about it, you know, how long you've been in the church, that matters too. So you have to have a lot of grace, but you also should not be afraid to, to come talk to your pastor about it. So that's where I would start. If they reject you and it's not an issue that's, that's the gospel, like something that's specifically the gospel, not just like your tevas are the wrong color, like I, nothing like that. Um, or like, I really just don't like the sound of your voice, you know, stuff like that, because people do complain about that sort of thing. If it's actually gospel-oriented and you're worried, talk to them, give them a chance to clarify, and if they will not, it's time for you to walk away from the church. Um, if you're, if you're I, I recommend if you are a member of the church, and this is really serious, step two is to bring someone who is also a member of the church, who is also concerned, to try again before you would ever go out and say, oh, start giving warnings about the church. So there is a protocol that we're supposed to follow. Um, and that's how I'd recommend doing it. Never be afraid to talk to your pastor. Never be afraid to hold somebody with a microphone accountable. Do not trust them. Test them. You have to do this. So it's an excellent question. Hey, Anna. Hey, uh, Lee. I had a question. Uh, and we've kind of talked about this a little bit, but uh, being an SBC baby, I have zero credit hours in church history. So um, can uh, talking, you, you know, I've talked about like the singularity of salvation, this kind of culture that we've built. Wh I think I have an idea what that was born of, but I wasn't. Wh where do you think that came from that we point to? Like, for example, you talked about how do you know you're saved? Uh, you know, well, we're told to examine ourselves, uh, but historically or, or not historically, but in recent history, it, it's the emphasis is placed on, well, don't you remember when you repeated after someone right. or, or a singular event? What, yeah. what was that born of, do you think? It, I, th I think it was born out of the revival period because that, that's where we first really see in history that needing to have that date, that like this is the day I was saved. And that you hear that. People, I was saved on such and such a day, and such and such a month, such and such a year. Excellent. Nothing wrong with that at all. Um, but that hasn't, certainly hasn't been around. Um, and in fact, there are a lot of Christians that do not have a date. I'm one of them. Um, I, I don't, I can tell you a time period where it became, it became very real, but even then it was a process. It wasn't like a, a lightning bolt from the sky sort of thing. So I think it comes from a cultural norm and it comes from a cultural background that has that as that definitive moment. And it's okay if the reality is, even if they were, say they were saved, you know, the truth is if you were from God's perspective and you're like, you really want a date, actually you were saved about a week and a half earlier um, than what you are saying it is. I, it doesn't matter, you know, so long as you're there. And it's a beautiful thing culturally, really. I think it's marvelous. How, I've always been jealous of the people that have dates. Um, so I think that's where that came from, is from the revival movement, because that's when the first time we see it in history. But that's just me. I had a question um, with regard to the Bible itself. Is there a particular version that you like, or is there a version that that you you, you that tends to speak to you a little bit more than other versions? I can't say there's a version that speaks to me more. I I tend to use different versions depending on what setting I'm in because that's why there are different versions. So for example, this is an ESV. This is my evangelism Bible. I've carried it since I was 15 years old. It's you can you can tell because it's falling apart. Um, the reason why I carry this is because my primary concern back then and all the way through college was evangelizing to Jehovah's Witnesses, Mormons, Christian Scientists, Scientologists, things like that. And the ESV is the closest in the Greek when on issues that I have to regularly deal with with semantics, like first, or this first chapter of John, for example. And so it's the easiest way for me to bridge the semantic gap with these people. Where, whereas I'm using a Spurgeon Bible tonight, which is my personal um, Bible that I use during devotions. Um, it's a Christian standard. Um, I have an old NIV in my office. Gosh, I've got, I've got everything. I would stay away from the message. Not that it's something you can't use, it's just, 
it's a little hairy when it comes to whether or not it's an actual translation, right? Like if this is the Qui-Gon Jinn of Bibles, the message is Jar Jar Binks. Like you just, <laughs> just don't. Um, so I would just go, go based on what you're, go based on what you're dealing with as far as like if you're doing personal devotions, um, just pick a Bible that you, that you really enjoy reading. A lot of people, for the, a lot of people, it's the NIV. I actually recommend a Spurgeon Bible, which you can pick up at truthforlife.com for about 30 bucks just because it gives you sermon notes right in there. And I, I prefer that because I like, I like the depth. But then if you're one of my students, especially if you're a younger student, I give an apologetics Bible because the apologetics Bible has all of my colleagues, experts in their fields, writing major synopses over all the contested like texts that people argue over regularly outside of Christianity, within Christianity, atheists. And they're giving you articles every time and explaining difficult passages every time. It's marvelous. It's easily picked up on Amazon. So if you need more detail, I can give you more detail. Just let me know what you need. I am a visitor at this church. Hello. Um, hello. Um, what are your thoughts on uh, the gospel screamers, the ones that um, go to concerts <laughs> or like a, a big celebrate? Uh, the different um, Hollywood um, events and stuff and are saying you're, you're going to hell if you don't. I mean, they're saying truthful things, but I feel that the, the love of Christ is not in that. And it seems like it does. There's fights and arrests, and I don't know how to handle that. Yeah, in apologetics, we call that the shotgun approach. Um, you're trying to hit as many people with the message of the gospel as quickly as humanly possible and as emphatically as humanly possible. I don't think it works very well. I've seen it as far as like street evangelizing because I was in New Orleans street evangelizing with some friends and um, one of my friends is not, um, he doesn't scream, but he's definitely the, the street evangelist type where he just starts evangelizing live as loudly as he possibly can and just ignores people. Um, and sometimes that makes people uncomfortable. I think it's excellent. A lot of people respond really well to that. Others don't. For the most part, the scriptures are relational. Um, not entirely, but for the most part, they're relational. So as far as being persuasive, I have found that it's much more effective to maintain the relational element, which is part of the reason why we do it this style. I like the dynamic style. We're a community. You should be able to ask me questions. I'm only up here in this setting as opposed to you know sitting in a group because we have more people than can comfortably sit in a group otherwise I wouldn't even have this set up it's just easier um, it's not it's not that they're doing it incorrectly I think they're being lazy if I can be completely honest I find it lazy it's as though they're trying to it's as though they're trying to almost make themselves feel better about evangelizing in the way that they never actually have to have a conversation with anybody who's really going to challenge them. They can just yell it in their face and run. <laughs> so I don't know. I've seen it work before, though, so I can't say it's completely wrong. I just, it's not my style for sure. I think there are settings. I mean, I can think right now. If I were in, for example, Mecca during a pilgrimage, and I had to figure out the best way to get the gospel out as quickly as humanly possible, that's the one I'd pick. So, and I find that could be pretty effective. <laughs> so, you see what I mean? It depends. Hello, Hi. Anna. Hello. Um, so, I can't remember exactly where the scripture is, but it talks about that the Holy Spirit has to move upon you to, for you to accept Christ. Excellent. Um, can you speak on that? Yes. I can't remember the scripture. <laughs> I, don't, I don't have my iPad with Just me. like in general, just, you just talk about that. So one of the things that, that happens is that the Holy Spirit has to open your heart in order for you to receive the message of God. And what does that mean? That's actually a pretty, the, the specifics of how that process works ends up beginning the basis for the free will debate within Christianity. So we're actually playing with the idea of doing a free will night for Roger Christie. It would be unfair of me to deal with your question 
with such limited time, um, especially if I want to be fair to the, the different positions in Christianity because um, it's just too much to go over. But yes, you are correct that there are scriptures that say that the Holy Spirit must open your heart first before you can even receive the scriptures and how that process works and what is called the ordo salutis, the order of salvation, where in that order those things happen, where does that fall is a big debate, but it's there. Does that answer your question at least? We can have lunch and I can go into it, but right now it wouldn't be fair to me or to represent the other. I, would, I ended up saying something that people would be like, what? It is. <laughs> We're playing with the idea of handling free will. I don't know if we can handle it in two hours, but <laughs> I'll try. And um, you referred to um, your Bible there and the message mm -hmm. with terms that I've never heard. heard yeah, of. this is this is the English Standard Version. Well, no, no, not that, but some other. Oh, the Message Bible. Well, the Message and that Bible you referred to them as. Yeah. Oh, oh! I was just giving making a Star Wars analogy to help people understand. So, like. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, if you, yeah, so it's Jar Jar Binks, probably not somebody you ever want to have to deal with. Qui-Gon Jinn, he's good. So we'll just, here, here's the deal. We'll watch Star Wars together. And then I will make, I will make the equivalent Bible analogy. There you go. Yeah, sorry, I didn't mean to be confusing. <laughs> yeah, we've used Star Wars analogies in the previous nights. That's why I went there in my brain. Could you talk about once saved, always saved? Yes, perseverance of the saints. Jesus says that of the ones the Father give him, I will or give me, I will lose none. If Jesus says that you're saved, you're saved. You don't have to worry about him. Again, to use my illustration that I was using, you don't have to worry about him setting you down once he's picked you up. There's no such thing as being justified before God and then losing that justification and then regaining that justification and then losing it and hoping that hopefully before you die, you're in the I've got it section instead of the I've lost it section. That's not a thing. That's what the once saved, always saved is the reference point to. Is that enough of an explanation? Okay. I've been watching Sid Roth and uh, his TV program is uh, It's Supernatural. Okay. Uh, are you familiar with him? I think is so. It? Not uh, not very. Oh, then it's going to ask you what you think of it. It's Sometimes it's really, really good, and other times I wonder, is this just made up? He talks about miracles and It's called things. Supernatural? Yeah. He's, Where are you watching it? Uh, da uh, Daystar. Okay. I might be able to YouTube it. It's um, Sid Roth. It's Supernatural. Okay. I know I've heard yeah. of it before. I know that name and I've heard of it. You have to forgive me. I don't come from the Bible Belt at all. Oh. And when I got here, I found out all the things that I had missed. And a lot of times people bring up things that I have never even heard of that I probably should have. And I just don't, I have, I just, it wasn't a thing. For example, Veggie Tales. <laughs> you you have, <laughs> you have singing, dancing vegetables, teaching Bible stories to children here. That wasn't a thing where I grew up. That's amazing. <laughs> so there's lots of things I'm yeah. learning about. Sid Roth is a converted Jew. Okay. I'll look it up. I'm sorry I couldn't help you. I'll, I'll, I'll try to look it up for next time. Yes. Hi, Anna. Hello. You mentioned tonight um, the idea of faith only versus faith plus works. And, of course, that idea is not exclusive to other religions such as Mormonism, but it's also prevalent within even Protestant churches. Mm -hmm. um, and in dealing with this, I was hoping to ask you to address ways in which, um, well, when I've spoken to different people about this, I've had trouble getting them to recognize that there is any sort of arrogance in that belief because they are they are humble in thinking that they are unworthy that they don't 
deserve grace and that they would, uh, the idea that they could lose their salvation or that they uh, didn't have to then continue to work for it to earn it in addition to the faith. Um, for someone who is, is used to accepting their unworthiness in, in this humility, how is there any explanation that to depend on your works afterward does indicate that there is some sort of arrogance that you can, that you can do enough to earn your salvation? Yeah, is, there, is there a type of arrogance after you're justified to say that you can keep earning it? Is that what you're asking? No. Not quite. Um, no, just the idea that um, to say that we then have to work for it mm -hmm. means that we are then doing something that yeah. justifies us by our own works later. Right. So the in justification and sanctification, so like the sanctification process is what comes after justification and sanctification is you being conformed to the image of Christ that's you walking out mm -hmm. what holiness looks like and struggling with the scriptures and being made aware of your sins that sort of thing um, when you're dealing with justification there's obviously we, you rightly pointed out there's no amount of work that you could do to get to the point of justification mm -hmm. then after it when you're countering groups that are teaching that you still have to do works after justification as though justification is like a coin in your back pocket that gets you part of the way there mm -hmm. and then and you can't deserve that that was a free gift that you got mm -hmm. right but it only gets you part of the way there and you have to pick up the rest of the way mm -hmm. which is usually what the jehovah's witnesses teach which is where i got that analogy of the coin in the pocket um it, that is it in and of itself a failure to understand what legally justified means they are already undoing what justification means as soon as they say it's only partial. It's not partial, it's full. <laughs> Sanctification is just you talking with the spirit about being made closer to Christ. It has no bearing whatsoever on salvation. So if you're encountering other denominations within Christianity or people who are, are attending these denominations who are teaching that you know you really still need to perform this, Jesus, Jesus and you are supposed to look a lot more similar right now. I mean, you've been a Christian long enough that you know, you really should be further along, and I'm not sure you're saved. They're already missing the point. That's not the basis upon which we judge that one. Does that make sense? Is that what you're dealing with? I can't tell if I'm answering your question correctly or not. Does that work? Yeah. They're mistaking justification. Right. So justification is the root, right? We talk about good works being fruit. Fruit is an evidence that the tree is healthy already, that the tree's already there. The fruit doesn't cause the tree to grow. The root is justification. The fruit is what you look for when somebody says, I have a root. I have a root. Well, okay, then we should be seeing some fruit over here. That's what that means. And so if you're claiming, no, no, I've got a root, and there is no fruit, you have to be like, well... I'm not sure you really know what I have a root means. And we need to talk about that because I'm not sure it means what you think it means. That's what that is talking about. You see the difference? Could we, um, Brooks or Chris, could you put up the justification, sanctification side by side so we can get those, those words back up? Thank you. Yeah, there we go, root and fruit. Did I see somebody else? Hey, Anna. Hi, Sam. So uh, speaking about fruit, one of the things that I kept getting, getting tripped up with younger when I was earlier in life was about um, salvation and sanctification. Uh, I was looking at passages where Jesus says, you'll bear fruit, you know, 10 to 100 fold. Um, and I was talking with people about the gospel and doing what I thought was uh, evangelizing, but no one was responding in the affirmative. So I, I didn't see what I was considering fruit in my life, and that started to cause me to question whether or not I was actually saved and on the process of sanctification, because no one seemed to be interested um, in me telling them, them about the gospel. Got it. So how, how would you um, counsel someone who, who didn't think they were seeing fruit in their life, 
uh, in the way they wanted to and was struggling with uh, questions about their mm -hmm. initial salvation. Yeah, fruit in your life is personal. God is sovereign. He is the one who determines who is justified and who is not. It's entirely up to God. Our job is to do what he's asked us to do. We're not supposed to convert anybody. We're just supposed to give the message. The conversion process is entirely out of our hands. Um, we are asked to do so kindly. We are asked to do so repeatedly, and we are asked to spend our whole life here doing that because it's the most important thing that we can do. So the fruit that we're looking for when we talk about fruit, especially as a young person dealing with this, is not my ability to convert people. The fruit you're looking for is how aware are you of sin, and are you changing that? How much has the Spirit been poking at you about things that you've been getting wrong, and how are you responding? And in some cases, it can be, why aren't you evangelizing? That can be something the Spirit talks about. But the actual process of conversion is entirely up to God. So that's what I would clarify to young Sam, who's struggling with that, because it's not our job. It's entirely possible you can evangelize your entire life and never see somebody turn to Christ. It's not your job. That's right. It's just your job to send the message kindly, respectfully, and clearly. Right, and it's entirely possible that that person comes to the Lord way later and you were part of the process, but you were part of the beginning process. That person that put that thing in their mind that they've been thinking about at 3 a.m. that you never get to hear about, it's entirely process possible that you're that person and not the person at the end who gets to see all of the, the, the firm, the baptism happen and all that stuff. So. Okay, so my question is back to once saved, always saved. Yes. And baptism. Mm -hmm. um, I have relatives that um, were baptized, raised in the church, mm -hmm. um, and married into um, a Jewish marriage, denounced their baptism, sure. and live on. Mm -hmm. What are your thoughts on salvation for them? First John says that the people who go out from us who were once part of us, the reason why they go out is to demonstrate that they were never a part of us to begin with. Now, I'm not saying that that's what's happening right now because I can't read hearts. But in the cases where you have people who you're just completely shocked, it's happened to me too, you're like, oh my goodness, this person has gone and completely denounced Christianity. Why did that happen? Because God has a regular habit of making certain that people who are not Christians are exposed not because he's trying to make them hurt or hurt any of their family members, but because they need to know so that it can get fixed. Pain is a sign that something's wrong. He wants them home too. And it's better that we're aware that that's where they are in their minds than if we had not known that the whole time. That's what's going on usually, at least in my experience. First John, let me pull it up so I can get... I don't remember. Let me just pull it up. First, it's First John. Mm -hmm. Let's see if I can read it all here. First John two nineteen. Hello, me again. Mm -hmm. um, you had mentioned a major kind of quasi theological idea that's theistic, moralistic. Moralistic therapeutic deism. Moralistic therapeutic deism, yes. MTD. Uh, thank you. You can Google that if you need to review what it means. Well, I was going to say, are there more? I, I, I'm aware of the borderline humanistic tendencies that have permeated the Roman Catholic Church. Are there mm -hmm. any other mainline groups that claim to be Christian who exhibit those characteristics that we ought to know about or at least be wary of when we're talking to our neighbors? No, I can't say that there are any like mainline groups that are specifically like this is moralistic therapeutic deism in formalized fashion. The problem with moralistic therapeutic deism is that it's like peppered across the body of Christ. It's in our churches. It's in our young people. And I'm, what I'm encountering it as is because I'm stationed on a university campus, and that's where I do the, most of my work um, as, as a Russia Christie apologist. And it's that the students who are coming – who are saying, I don't want anything to do with Christianity anymore, the 80% that are walking away, when I, when I ask them what is Christianity, that's what they're telling me. And I'm sitting there going, you, you've never been exposed to Christianity then, because that's not Christianity. So no wonder you're walking away. And that's part of the problem that we're having. I think one of the reasons I just saw a poll talking about how badly our numbers are dropping in Christianity in America, 
I'm not entirely certain that that's actual Christianity dropping. I think it's moralistic therapeutic theism and Christianity, and everybody's calling that whole thing Christianity and the moralistic therapeutic deists are going off going, this is crap and doesn't work for me because it is. And that's why you're seeing the numbers drop because that's all we're seeing on campus. Hi. Hello. How do you start the conversation? I'm in an environment with, um, at work that is completely secular and full of atheists. Mm -hmm. um, so w number one, I have the threat of losing my employment, um, which is worth losing. Mm -hmm. um, but it's just starting the conversation. How do you, how do you approach that? Yeah. Um, the Peter's epistles are great for this because the, the, the whole defense against the defending Christianity part where we're, we're responsible for defending, giving up a defense for the hope that is in us. A lot of times people won't quote this out and I don't know why, but the beginning of that verse says, sanctify the Lord in your heart and then be ready to give a defense to those who ask you. There is something to be said about waiting for your coworker to ask and I know that this happens because I've been in similar situations. It's okay not to walk in as John the Baptist and throw locusts on them. Like, it's okay. And you can wait for them to ask. And if you have sanctified the Lord in your heart, then you know it's time. They've asked. And then when they say, are you evangelizing to me? You say, I'm just answering your question. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. But as far as beating yourself up as a Christian for maybe you need to be doing more, you need, you need to be have you know, maybe start a Bible study before a work day. Invite people if they want to come and don't. We don't have to browbeat people with our Bibles and we're not called to do that. Yeah. Pray at your desk. Yeah. You're doing great. That's how I would start that conversation in that scenario. But that's just me. That is our time. I'll go ahead and call it so that you guys can get time to go home and enjoy your families on a Sunday evening. I will still be up here to answer any questions that you would still have. Thank you for coming. We will see you next month in handling the evidence for the resurrection because there's a ton and a lot of it is stuff that even atheists will have to agree to. So you don't want to miss it. All right. All right. That's right. Have a good night, everybody. Be safe. <laughs>